glory be to God once more. We are on the 12th lesson of uh, this quarter, and uh, the presenters are Ruth Akinyi. Praise the living God. Together with uh, Helen Mokora. God is good. And uh, with me, Jennifer Ila. We are going to present the lesson with the title, Deuteronomy in the New Testament. Our memory text comes from the book of Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. And before we read, shall we have a prayer from Sister Helen? Uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, our everlasting master, we want to thank thee. We want to appraise your name. Thank you for the life that you've bestowed upon us. Thank you for availing us for this meeting, Jehovah. We are here for a special purpose to discuss the lesson. Be with our hearers, guide us with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, before we go to the memory text, uh, the topic says Deuteronomy in the New Testament. Last week we read about Deuteronomy in the uh, later writers. And here, the New Testament is part of the Bible where we get that uh, Deuteronomy was also seen as an element in the New Testament. And let's get the memory text from Ruth. The Bible says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Uh, thank you, Sister Ruth. I believe these words were spoken by Jesus himself. Uh, we remember when Jesus was on the mountain for 40 days after being baptized, and then Satan went there. Uh, even though Satan also said it is written, Jesus answered him, it is written. Satan was referring to it is written uh, re uh, regarding the miracles uh, that uh, he expected to happen. But Jesus was uh, guided by the Holy Spirit and he referred to it is written according to the spiritual guidance of, God, of the scripture that was inspired by God. Now, Jesus said that it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Uh, this is very true when we look at uh, the bread that we eat. Satan was referring to the bread that we eat. He believed that uh, when Jesus would do a miracle of changing the bread, in, the stones into bread so that he could eat, but Jesus referred him to the book of Deuteronomy, saying that it is written. Uh, the writing could not come from anywhere else but from the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy where it was written that man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When we look at this, we are comparing what was in the Old Testament and what is in the New Testament. We want to see the element of Deuteronomy. And Sister Ruth, yes. uh, it is written. Can you say something about it is written in the New Testament? Okay, thank you so much, Sister Jennifer. Uh, as she has explained, we are talking about Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. And we realize that Jesus, after being tempted, during that time when Satan posed a challenge, Jesus was ready with a verse to support his action. And we realize that when we look at the way Jesus was acting, Jesus was doing things to show that even the New Testament is a fulfillment of the things in the Old Testament. The same, the same things that God ha was commanding the Israelites to do is the same that Jesus was referring to during this time of his temptation. But let us look deeply into the aspect of bread that was the, the devil was bringing in. Jesus looks after our spiritual well-being, but Satan was concerned about the physical well-being, the material well-being of people. And that's why he posed that challenge to Jesus. 
But Jesus went to, to fast because he wanted to get full power of the Holy Spirit. He set apart that time so that he could get much strength so that he, 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 will, he be able to do his ministry just as God wanted him to do it. When he answered Satan that we do not live by bread alone but by the word that comes from the mouth of God, it means that Jesus was more concerned about the spiritual well-being while Satan was concerned about the physical well-being. And likewise, it is a challenge unto us. Many a times we fall into temptation because we care about the physical well-being of our lives or our families. And Jesus brought us a challenge that any time temptation comes, we are not just supposed to look at the physical well-being. We are not just supposed to look at the material gains. But let us look deeply into what implications our choices can have in our spiritual well-being also. Uh, thank you, Sister Ruth. Sister Ellen, yes. something about it is written. Okay, thank you, Madam Jennifer. Just as Sister Ruth has said, now we know that uh, this is during the time that Jesus had taken 40 good days in the wilderness and 40 nights without eating anything. So Satan was there ready to tempt, to tempt him. Uh, even when we look at, because Sister Ruth has really exploited the first ad, uh, attempt whereby he told Jesus that, can you turn the stones into bread so that you may eat? Then Satan went ahead to the second trial where he took Jesus to the pinnacle and then he told Jesus, if you are really the son of man, then can you fall down? Because it is also written. Then uh, there is something that is very interesting there, that even Satan also referred to a writing from the book of Psalmist. Mm -hmm. So Satan also can use the Bible to give some reference. But we are happy that Jesus told Satan that, do not try your God. You should not try your, your God. So even us, we are supposed to argue from the Bible content. Uh, we see that at many, a time, many a times, we base our argument on baseless issues. But Jesus, when he was tempted, he was arguing from the Bible. So as Christians, we should also argue from the Bible. And even those who are trying to make us not to draw upon the right path may also see Jesus and receive Jesus. So we are happy that after that, Jesus emerged because of the references that he made to the Satan following the books that he referred to. Uh, thank thank you. you, Sister Ellen. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 3, Moses was uh, recounting for the Israelites uh, that God would provide for their physical well-being and also spiritual well-being. These two things go together. There is no time you can have physical well-being without spiritual well-being and things are right. You must have the two so that everything becomes right. And therefore, when we look at uh, the book of Deuteronomy, the chapter 8, verse 3, and we compare it with the book of Hebrews 4, 12, and uh, we also compare it with other books in the New Testament, we see that there's uplift of some Deuteronomy elements uh, uh, into the books, the, new, the books of the New Testament. Now, when we look at uh, lifting up faces, this is the character of God. And uh, Sister Ruth, yes, do we have something on lifting up faces? Okay, thank you so much once again. Uh, when we read the book of Deuteronomy chapter 10, Moses is once again talking about their history and the experiences the Israelites have has had with God. And we realized that the Israelite way of doing things was that at some point when someone had an issue and a judgment had to be passed, the person passing the judgment, that is the judge, would look keenly to the person who is being accused. And then the status quo of that person or the name or the tribe from which he came from would determine the kind of judgment that person got. And that is the, where we get the phrase, lifting up faces. 
and that is passing judgment based on whose image is at stake. Uh, when we go through Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 17 to 19, we are told that God is saying to the Israelites that they are supposed to love everyone equally, just as God loved them equally without minding the kind of a people they are. We know very well how the Israelites angered God several times. But because of his grace and his love, he was always able to endure with them and he took care of them in the wilderness. And this same aspect is manifested in the New Testament. We find Jesus Christ who came into the world and throughout his lifestyle, he was even accused of, ming of mingling with the sinners. He was even accused of mingling with those people who had no name in the society. And this was truly the, the attribute of God himself. That is, God is not a respecter of persons. Regardless of someone's status, regardless of your name or position in the society, Jesus was ready to mingle with everyone. He did miracles to the rich and to the poor alike. He did miracles to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And this is a call unto us Christians. Just as it was in the, in the days of the Israelites, the same it was in the days of Jesus, and the same it is now. We are called not to pass any judgment based on the status of people, but we are told to love people without any bias. Uh, thank you, Sister Ellen. Uh, this lifting up of faces uh, therefore means that uh, your judgment... Do you look at others uh, the same way you look at the uh, other people, the poor and the rich? Do you look at them uh, in the same way or your judgment will be different? Can you tell us something about your take? Okay, thank you. Uh, now, uh, according to what Sister Ruth has just said, just to put some more word on it, now we should uh, actually act with a lot of fairness and uh, we should show no, we should show no partiality. So go, our God regardeth not any person, or does it? Does our God take any reward? What we know is that the God that we worship is a true God that shows no partiality, for there is no partiality with that our God. And when we read from these books of the New Testament, even the Acts and Romans, Galatians, we get that God actually act with a lot of fairness. And that is why, even unto the cross, he sent his son so that we can all be saved only when we allow ourselves to follow or to walk upon his, his, uh, his, uh, his commandments. And that is why, even us, when uh, Paul was talking with the Galatians, and even when we read from the book of Ephesians, we get that... Uh, there was, they were being told that even the masters treat your servants that just in the same way as you would wish people to treat you. So as Christ, Christians of today, we should love everybody without looking into their status. And we should act with a lot of fairness regardless of who we are considering, regardless of how poor those people are, but we consider all of them. Then last year, I would also say, in this regard of uh, acting without partiality, then we should also take the word of God to everyone. Or we should move to places, regardless of who they are, so long as we make them receive the word of God and they can also be, be saved. Thank you, sister. Uh, thank you, Jew or Gentile, we have to take the word of God. Poor or rich, we have to treat people equally. Master or slave, we have to be fair in our treatment. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10, verse 17, we get that God does not accept bribe and does not treat people with partiality. Therefore, when we take the character of God, whom we depict and we get from the character of Jesus Christ, who came from God himself, the way he treated people, then we should also do the same as Christians of today. Uh, let us look at cast on a tree. Sister Ruth. Yes. Ah, cast on a tree. 
uh, we all know the kind of death that Jesus died for our sake. Jesus was hanged on a tree, and in the Jewish culture, that was the most shameful kind of death. The other offenders used to be stoned to death outside the city. But we realize that Jesus was hanged on a cross. When we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23, we realize that there is a curse that is upon that person that is hanged on a tree. And why is it that this person who is hanged on a tree is cursed, yet our king, our savior, is hanged on a tree? We realize that we are the ones who are supposed to die. We are the ones who are supposed to be hanged on that tree. But because Jesus accepted to take our place, Jesus also accepted the curses that were upon us. So Jesus had to be hanged on that tree for our sake so that we may get life. But then there are also other aspects that come in this aspect of being cast on a tree. When we go through Gal Galatians chapter 3 verses 1 to 14, we get Paul talking about salvation by faith. And he also talks about justification by keeping the law. When Paul says salvation is by faith, we realize that Abraham was counted righteous because of his faith in God. And that is when we look at verse 6 of Galatians chapter 3. We are told that Abraham, because he believed in God, he was counted righteous. And we are also told in verse 11 that the law does not justify anyone, but the just shall only live by faith. What does this teach us? This teaches us that after having faith in the Lord, after having faith in the death of Christ Jesus on the cross on our behalf, we are therefore counted righteous because we have faith and we believe in him. And what this faith will do in us is that just like Abraham having faith in God followed God's commands, we are also going to obey. We are going to keep the law, not because we expect salvation from the law, but because the law has already given us salvation. And this salvation, because the, God, the, the death of Jesus Christ has already given us salvation. And therefore, having faith in that death of Jesus Christ will help us to obey the law and to keep everything that Jesus wants us to keep. And therefore, we'll be counted righteous. So anytime you look at the law, Imagine that the law is just there to guide you, but the only way for you to get salvation is by having faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, thank you, Sister Ruth. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 27, verse 26, says uh, that the law, uh, uh, we do not depend on Christ by obeying the law, but only, but also to work by faith. When you have faith in Jesus, Christ, then our obedience to the law will just come. If you have faith in somebody, then anything that he says, you will tend to follow. So when we have faith in Jesus Christ, then we will follow the laws of God. Uh, let us all turn to the faith and have faith in Jesus Christ so that we follow the laws uh, it, they will be very easy for us to follow if we have faith. Uh, unlike when we don't have faith, it will be a burden to us. We won't be able to follow the laws easily because we don't have faith on whom we are following. Otherwise, Sister Helen, something on cast on a tree. Okay, thank you, Sister Jennifer. I just wanted to say that Jesus became a cast because of our sins. So he carried the shame of our sins and he was hanged on the cross. So when we read this one quite well, when we peruse over it, we get that any moment that we still are sinning, then it is as if we are still hanging Jesus Christ on the cross. And that is why we talk of the faith. Now, we are made righteous by having faith in God. That is, it is not us, 
But through the Holy Spirit now, the Holy Spirit, Jesus will now dwell uh, on us through the Holy Spirit. And in that way, we will walk upon his way and we will not trod. So that is why the hearers, the listeners, we are kindly urging you that let us seek to have faith in the Lord. And through the Holy Spirit, then we will always be walking upon the right path. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sister Ellen. In the Old Testament, we are getting prophets. And uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, when we look at Deuteronomy 21, 23, and we compare it to Galatians 3, 14, uh, it talks about a prophet. And this prophet uh, maybe came in the letter in the New Testament. Shall we get a prophet like unto thee from Sister Ruth? Okay, thank you so much. Once again, we are just talking about Deuteronomy and comparing it to the notes in the New Testament. A prophet like unto thee. First thing we have to realize is that Moses is speaking to the Israelites and he's saying the words that God told him, that he will raise a prophet like him, that God would raise a prophet like him. And Moses was an ordinary man who was living among ordinary men. So the first thing we have to note that is this prophet will be brought up in a normal environment, in an ordinary environment. And that's why God insists that the people had to be blameless before the Lord. The people had to point God to the neighboring nations because God had a purpose for them and God had an intention of raising a prophet from among them. When we go through Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 15 to 19, Moses is talking about this prophet who God promises to raise from among them. And if we get a comparison with the book of Acts chapter 3 verses 22, we realize that Peter, when addressing the people after the ascension of Christ into heaven, Peter also refers to this same statement that God spoke of through Moses, that he would raise a prophet like Moses, and this prophet would only speak words that are from God. The same to Acts chapter 7 verses 37, when Stephen was being stoned to death, Stephen also referred to that same promise that God had made through Moses. And we realize that when we look at the attributes of Moses, when he was leading the Israelites, number one, Moses acted like an intercessor between the Israelites and God. Anytime there was a problem, he would intercede for the people before God. And then Moses was a mediator. Anytime there was an information to be passed across, remember the people had refused to see the face of the Lord because it was like a horror to them. So Moses became the mediator. He would pass information from both the people to God and from God to the people. And we realize that in the New Testament, we have a prophet who acted like Moses, and that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came to speak only the words of God, just like God had said. And he came to intercede between man and God. And this is the same prophet that Peter and Stephen are referring to when they are talking about that prophet that God had promised. And therefore we realize that the coming of Christ was not only a New Testament thing, but from the times of the Israelites, the coming of Jesus Christ was already known. Thank you, Sister Ruth. Sister Ellen, what is your take about this prophet like unto thee? Okay, just at the onset, when we read from the book of Deuteronomy 4, 6 to 8, we get that Moses warns the people of Israelites that they should shun away from their hidden practices. But still they did not take heed of whatever they were being told. And uh, at all times, the main purpose why the Israelites were called was that they would show some light to the hidden so that other nations would also follow and also obey God. But they did not, they did not take heed of the instructions that they were gi being given. So Moses pointed out in the book of Deuteronomy, just as Sister Ruth had said, Moses is pointing at Jesus. The people, and in that book it is said that 
the people will now yield to Jesus. And how do we yield to Jesus? We yield to Jesus when we, we obey him and we have faith in him. That he was the only one that was lift, lifted up. Just as during the period of wilderness, we saw a snake that was lifted up. Jesus was also lifted amongst all the prophets. And therefore, we should have faith in him. We should follow his path. And just as a Sister Ruth has put it, you know, we are studying the book of Deuteronomy uh, in proportion to the New Testament. So we get even people like Stephen at their point of death. They were still referring to the prophet, and that was who? Jesus Christ. So at all times, whether we are at which point, then we should always uphold Jesus Christ that is the only Messiah. And when we uphold him, then all the promises will be fulfilled of going to the new heaven and seeing the new Jerusalem. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Len. So it is true that uh, this prophet Jesus was uh, talked about long time ago during the time of Moses. And Moses was promised that a prophet would come that would act the same way Moses acted with the Israelites all the way through Egypt up to the land of Canaan. And after that, the prophet came in the New Testament. And we get that all these promises that were given in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, are now here with us in the New Testament, during the reign of Jesus Christ, who was also cast on the cross uh, to bear our sins as human beings. Now, a fearful thing is coming. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, um, Sister Ruth, what is this fearful thing? Okay, a fearful thing. We are being taken to the book of Hebrews. And one aspect that we find that is talked of quite often in the book of Hebrews is faith. And we realize that from the time we started studying about Deuteronomy, we had that part of the Israelites that they were supposed to play in the covenant relationship. That is, they were supposed to have faith in God. They were supposed to obey God. That was their part. And this aspect of faith is also coming in the Hebrews, in the New Testament. We realize that faithfulness was rewarded. And when we read Hebrews 11, we see what the heroes of faith did because of the kind of faith they had. And we, we, we are also told that anytime we have faith, this faith should originate from our love for God. When we behold God's goodness, when we think of the good things the Lord has done unto us, when we imagine that we are supposed to be hanged on a tree, when we imagine that we are supposed to face eternal death, and then God in his fullness of glory descended and was willing to die in our stead, then we are supposed to have fully, faith fully in him. And this should, be drive, should drive us to obey him and to keep everything that he says unto us. But there's that something else that comes in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 28 to 31. When we go back in history, in the history of Israelites, we realize that during Moses' time, the laws were given. And anyone who did not keep a particular law, it was ordered that they were supposed to be stoned to death outside the gates. But we realized that those people, they only had the information that they were given by Moses. At a time when God was promising them a better prophet to come. What then is Hebrews telling us? That if those people at that time, with the information they had, were stoned to death by mere men, what would happen to those who transgressed the law at this time? we realize that Christ came to show us the reality of having faith in God in an ordinary world. Christ came to show us that we can remain faithful even in an ordinary situation and win the sins that are around us. And we realize that there are people who still do not believe in Christ and these are the people that we are being told that they will face the wrath of God. These are the people who will fall in the hands of God himself. 
Imagine if by then it was that painful to stone people to death because of their disobedience. How fearful is it now if you fall a victim in the hands of God? Uh, thank you, Sister Ruth. In the hands of God. Now, uh, we only feared the death that was uh, put on the people of Israel who disobeyed the law of Moses by then. This death was uh, uh, done by ordinary people. People who are not creators. People who could kill you and then even after we have received our Savior Jesus Christ, you would still resurrect uh, because of the salvation that we have got from Jesus Christ. But then, now this fearful thing, it is about God himself. The death now will come from God the creator, whom when he kills, it is gone and gone forever, and your uh, existence is ceased uh, forever. Now, Sister Ellen, what do you say about this fearful thing? Uh, thank you, Sister Jennifer. Now, the most important thing here is stay faithful to the Lord. Because if during those time the people of Israelites could fear the judgment, uh, they were being stoned after tra transgressing the law. Uh, they could be hanged after transgressing the law. What about this time when we see the blood that was shed at the cross as worth worthless to us? Then we are actually going to face the true wrath of God. Just in Deuteronomy, the other lesson that we read, the people of Israelites were being reminded that do not provoke God. Do not provoke God. And even during this time, when we still sin, then we are provoking, provoking God, and we are going to face the true wrath of God, which will be eternal death. So it is actually uh, the book of Hebrew, as Sister Ruth had put it, uh, uh, Paul is telling us that we will face a sorrow punishment compared to the punishment that our forefathers had. We know that there was judgment, and Paul is trying to uh, buttress his point of argument from the book of, of Deuteronomy, because he's saying that if during those times, those people faced the wrath of God, but what about this time that God has actually provided for us? He has given us his only begotten son to die for our sins. So we are going to face the true wrath of God, which is eternal death. So let us try to be faithful to our God, because that is the key thing, that we stay faithful to the Lord. Uh, thank you, Sister Ellen. Dear viewer, as we go back to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verse 35, this is what Paul referred to. And he said that God himself says, vengeance is mine. It is for God. And then God will judge each and every person according to your, what you have done. And you know God's judgment is fair. And even if you claim that you have done no sin, God himself sees you even as that you do it uh, in a sacred place. And therefore his judgment is true. This time will be in the hands of God. The fearful thing is, the death will now be from God himself. It is God who will lay his hands on us when we don't obey his law. Unlike those days when it was our fellow men who would kill us, uh, the Israelites would be taken out of the gate and would be stoned to their death uh, because of the disobedience of the law. Now, let us all take heed. It is this time God himself who is going to be on us with his wrath and lay his hands on us. Remember those days when the Israelites were uh, uh, at the feet of the mountain and then God just tried to come. What they saw made them to tell Moses that please Moses, tell God to go back, we will obey. We don't want him to come near us because if he does so, we'll all be perishing in his hands. That is what will happen to us 
in those days that are coming. Uh, Sister Ruth, something for the viewer as we wind up. Okay, I would like to talk about this prophet, Jesus Christ. We realize from the book of John chapter 1 from verse 1 that in the beginning there was the word and the word was with God. And this word, when we continue reading, we realize that it is Jesus Christ. So we find Jesus from Genesis. We find Jesus through the prophet's messages in the Old Testament. We see Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And we even see Jesus Christ as the King of Kings in the book of Revelation. What this says is that our faith should always be centered on Jesus Christ. My brother, my sister, from wherever you are listening or hearing, make sure that you have faith in Jesus, in Jesus Christ. And this faith, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, will lead you to obedience and you will get the promises that are bound to those people who keep God's laws. Uh, thank you, Sister Ruth. Sister Ellen, something for the viewer as we finish. Okay, thank you, Sister Jennifer. Just a word to our viewers. As Christians who understand actually the cross and the shedding of blood, we should always know that we will actually face the wrath of God if we fail to be faithful to our Jehovah. So let us try by all means that through faith, because we've been told that uh, we are not made, we, are, we cannot be righteous by the word of the law, but through having faith in Jesus Christ. So through faith, let Jesus Christ be manifested in us through the Holy Spirit so that it is not us, but the Lord that dwelleth in us may lead us to uh, treading upon the right path. Thank, uh, you. thank you, Sister Ellen. Dear viewer, we are winding up saying that it is written. How do you use it is written? Sometimes, uh, some of us tend to use it is written the way Satan used it. We are depending on the miracles and not the uh, scripture that was inspired by God himself as we say it is written. As much as we say it is written, as we defend ourselves uh, when we are talking to others or as we go out to tell people it is written, let us use it is written according to the inspired scripture and not depending on the miracles that we do or we see because we can be misled by this word it is written. Just like the way Satan also said it is written and actually it was written but what was the aspect of the writing that he was saying? Deuteronomy in the New Testament and that is where we are. Otherwise, uh, my viewer, thank you for being with us all this time and before we wind up, let's have a prayer from Sister Ruth. Let us believe and pray. Precious Master in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, for this opportunity that you've given unto us once again to look into your word. Thank you for speaking unto us through Deuteronomy in the New Testament. How we pray, dear Lord, that any time we look into your word, dear Father, may you give us a deeper understanding that we may use your scripture to enlighten our lives and to give us a spiritual well-being. May you help us to understand your word that you said in the Old Testament, even as we relate them to the, in, the, in the New Testament, dear Father. Help us to understand them and to relate them in a way that will give us a growth spiritually. Help the viewers wherever they are, dear Father, and may you help us, the panelists as well, even as we desire to get into the new Jerusalem, dear Father. May you help us to live according to your word while here on earth, and may your will be done in every aspect of our lives. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.